Truck, it is time for your Nooner with Dooner, your Fiverr with the Drivers. Thanks for tuning in. If you're on the live stream, podcast, on demand, YouTube, Sirius XM's Road Dog Trucking at 5 o'clock, I don't care. Thanks for coming in the house. I appreciate it. And I hope you all had a good day yesterday because there were some really, really bad storms that ripped through the country. In fact, over here in uh, Chattanooga, they sent my kids home early from school. There's a lot of panic on the news. Uh, tornadoes coming through. My friend Hallie Fazio, a couple years ago, her house got taken out by a tornado out here. So makes you a little nervous, especially for a Northeaster like me, not used to tornadoes. But nothing came through here. However, the rest of the country was not as lucky. Take a look at this truck driver over here in Louisville, Louisville, I should say, Kentucky. Show this driver right here. Thank you. We got that. Look at this. Well, it says right here, tornado crossed I-265 on the northeast corner of Louisville, Kentucky. Multiple tractor trailers got blown over. This driver was okay after they broke the glass out to free him. A few minor injuries were reported so far. Thanks, Charles Peake, for that video. Uh, that guy looks okay, but here it is. 14 tornadoes were reported Tuesday and Wednesday across Illinois, Kentucky, Ohio, Alabama, Tennessee, and Georgia, along with dozens of damaging wind reports. You saw that kid over there. I think that's, uh, was it the Louisville campus? He was getting blown away, blown down the street. Um, anything else on this? About 35 million people right now are under some sort of severe threat as more storms are blowing through. There's a lot of snow involved in there as well. Mr. Grinch says, it was nasty getting through Indianapolis earlier yesterday on the east side of town as I drove in. Then I settled down until I got near the airport. The parts of the sky turned into aqua green and black and the wind picked up again. Um, and for me, thinking that the, uh, what does he say? They had a tornado close to IMS once. All right, well, Mr. Grinch, I'm glad that you are okay. Now, here's an issue. The great John Kingston covered this. You can read this full story on FreightWaves.com. I'm just going to touch on it briefly, briefly. Show this headline. Truck lease purchase deals come under fire at Matt's end in court. Again, go to FreightWaves.com to read John Kingston's full scoop on here. But what this has to do with is the DOT's Truck Leasing Task Force. They recently had a hearing at Matt's, and uh, it was pretty clear the message, especially on the floor with actual drivers. Lease purchase programs rarely favor drivers, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a significant legal case underway in U U.S. District Court right now in Northern Illinois involving six plaintiffs that are suing Super Ego Holding and several affiliated companies with which the plaintiffs had leased on with. The attorney that, that leads this case said about 1,400 drivers had opted into this case, but they expect about 10,000 to 20,000, although they're saying it's not a class action suit. So that's a little confusing. Harris said he's very proud of, what is this here? Oh, this is, this is a comment right here. The role of the defender in the March 21st session, Matt Harris, this is a guy from Pathway Leasing. He said to the crowd at Matt's that he's very proud of the company's programs. We're fortunate to have a lot of people who have completed leases. But he says he added that there are dangers and pitfalls that people fall into. Yeah, I'm sure we can all agree with that. Have you been to the lease purchase program? Hit me up. We'll do a segment on this. Hit me up at Timothy Dooner on uh, Twitter, on LinkedIn, D-O-O-N-E-R, or email me, tdooner at freightwaves.com. We will get into it. Speaking of get into it, let's start the show. It's episode 701 here on What the Truck. I'm talking to Glide Technology CEO Kevin Demo about the words, the world's first road to rail autonomous solution. I can't wait to show this to you guys. I have a billion questions about this thing, and I'm going to talk to that gentleman in just a second here. Freightways Alan Adler, speaking of autonomous, he's fresh off a test ride in an, an Aurora autonomous truck. We're going to find out his impressions. We'll also learn, learn what goes down at GM's Fuel Cell Lab. We have Reliance Partners Jesse Merritt talking about insurance scale and growth and uh, we got a few other things for you, but right now we got Kevin right here. Kevin Demoa, founder and CEO at Glide Technologies. Kevin, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Tim. Thanks for having me, brother. So, hey, so people who have never met you before, what's, uh, what's, what's the elevator pitch on you before we get to the company? Yeah, gotcha. Uh, so I am a retired military veteran. Um, I am a, a mechanical engineer and an, an, a logistics expert, per se. I spent my entire career uh, moving people and places to you know, people and things to places and, uh, you know, and, and, and making sure that it, it they, that they got there safely. You, uh, you have a great background. You've been with SpaceX. You did logistics in the Army. How did, how has that helped forge you? Oh, yeah, no, totally. I started my, off my career uh, at 17, you know, joined, joined the U.S. military, uh, the Army. I did two, two tours in Iraq, one in Afghanistan. I said a cat only has nine lives. You know, I jumped out of the fire, firefight directly into the fire, joined the Air Force National Guard. 
and fought fires right here in California for about 13 years. Wow. Well, hey, first of all, thank you very much for your service. A little cowbell for that. We obviously appreciate it. Now, I saw a post from you on LinkedIn and it had like, it looked like a skateboard or something pulling a trailer. And I'm like, what am I even looking at? I got to talk to this guy about what he's building over here. Before we jump all into it, what's the elevator pitch on what y'all are doing over at Glide? Totally. We, we offer an autonomous road to rail solution um, that we're, we're meant to transport any kind of uh, trailer that, with the kingpin that's meant for the road or any kind of cart that's meant for uh, uh, for the railway. Uh, railway. And um, our, our whole thing is to be an, an OEM and a logistic provider at the same time in order to augment uh, different operations. Um, we're, we're completely decarbonized. We're looking to um, uh essentially take the carbon footprint down and streamline the logistics process from cradle to grave from from port all the way to uh the the first final mile customer interesting so why did you start this company what made you go in this direction of building like a road to the first road to rail autonomy <laughs> solution yeah i know so i sat back and i said well you know I, I spent my entire career from space you know to to bicycles to regular trucks and i said well how can i really make an impact now and I looked at the inefficiencies between the two modes and grounds. And I said, how can I take away the inefficiencies and combine the efficiencies in order to, you know, have a streamlined process. And at the same time, that little, that little transforming your desk, that was part of my inspiration as well. There's a transformer called the uh, Astro train that is okay. a, a railroad uh, a, a, and, and also a, uh, and a spacecraft. And I was like, man, that thing is super efficient. You know, let's, uh, let, let's see if we can do this in real life. And uh, went through the mechanical design, you know, spent many hours uh, trying to come up with the concept, and and here we are. You know, that's so good. An Astro Train, it's actually the first Transformer I got my kid. It was a three-in-one because he turns into <laughs> the flying, tr he turns into like a space shuttle. He turns into a train. He also turns into a robot. If you ever seen Transformers the movie, the way they play with scale in that kind of defies physics because they fly like Megatron, oh, yeah. everyone away, and every, even a even, uh, Devastator could transform inside of Astro Train. It was wild. But let's talk about oh, reality, it's crazy. Man. This looks so neat. So what, what is that? How does this work? What am I looking at here? Yeah, no, totally. So, so what you're going to see now in this, this next segment, um, we have, um, uh, we have, uh, it's controlled by LIDAR technology. Uh, so we have the ability to inspect the track as we go down. Uh, we're, we're able to go through it via a process called NDT, non-destructive testing. And uh, we're able to inspect the substrate and the rails. You know, what you just saw was the, 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 the train came up to a bit of debris. Typically, the train would derail. With our gliders, you're going to see in this next segment, the glider is able to back up off the track, get onto a road, and then glide its way on, on, onto its next destination. So, so essentially go around that debris, get back on the track, and then deliver the goods and cargo without derailing and without any kind of um, de detention or detainment there. So is this like pure hybrid? Is this spending like an equal amount of time on road and rail, or is it only going on road to get to other rail crossings? What's the design idea there? Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. So, so I mean, it's, it's essentially uh, your, your transload process packaged into one, you know, instead of, you know, go, uh, taking a forklift and all the material handling that's associated with transloading, you're canceling that entire process out. So, you know, we, our, us being on the road is great, but we want to be kings of the rail. We want to get to the rail because it's more efficient. Um, and uh, we feel that there's not a lot of capacity there as, as we all, you were all seeing today. Uh, so, our, so our whole thing is to get to the rail. Um, and then d deliver efficiency to our customers. Interesting. So it's an intermodal solution that you're sort of really building there. You're trying to key in on that market. What's the process with, like the rail's not always easy to interact with, right? Like how do you get access yeah. to the rails? How are you figuring that all out? Yeah, so so we're currently working with uh, short short lines. We feel that that's the, the, the easier customer to, to work with. Uh, given most of them are, are independently owned and operated. Uh, so we have to get permissions uh, from them. Uh, so they're incorporating us into their their, uh, their their schedule. We're currently working with a short line rail called PVJR, Portland Vancouver Junction Railroad, as well as a, a, uh, a trucking provider called Taylor Transport. And they already work together. So we get permission from those guys uh, and uh, we're able to, to schedule our, our train just to, just to do our beta tests. And we envision going going down the line, we'll be able to, uh, you know, um, uh, essentially mimic that entire process uh, for other customers until, you know, the, the FRA, you know, allows all of us to to get onto the rail um, for for class one.
Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because you can't talk about autonomous without the regulatory environment coming up. And a lot of most of all the autonomous I've talked to prior to you have just been focused on the road and they have to deal with the regulations and getting approval and all that. Then you also have to deal with the, the rail regulation. So how do you deal with both? That sounds complicated. Uh, it's very complicated. You know, the great thing is I spent my entire career dealing with uh, the DOT and, and working through 49 CFR. Um, it's, it's just it's just patience and grit. Um, it's, uh, you know, w waiting it all out, you know, uh, autonomous is the future of us all, um, you know, given the, the labor shortages that we're all experiencing, given the, the green direction that, that the world is going into, um, it, it just makes sense, uh, for the world to start to shift over to, and we're starting to see that on, on the road and, um, our brothers on the road will, will, will set the example for rail. And I feel eventually we'll, we'll break through. Big issue with EVs and autonomous trucks, especially the ones I have talked to, has been weight. you got to sacrifice 30 40% of the load that you could be pulling because of the weight on these things. But when I look at your vehicle, it's quite a bit different. It's quite a bit smaller. It's basically like a battery yeah. pack at a computer on wheels. How much do these things weigh? Yeah, no, cur currently each, each glider weigh, weighs about a ton. That's it. <laughs> what, how, and how much range does like the battery give you for a pack that size? Yeah, no, totally. So, so the the range will give you about six hundred miles on the 30, 30 minute charge. Uh, so, so we're able to go quite a bit. And the reason reason why we, we went with that configuration is is because we can pack a lot. Um, and uh, you know, typically on the road, you can only go up to you know eight eighty GVW. Um, and we're we're looking to first go privately, private road, and then with private road, we can actually transport a lot more weight given the rail um, is, is essentially no limit. So, you know, envision um, us transporting from the port, right, onto a, a rail spur. Now you're transporting 160 tons, you know, over the rail as opposed to, you know, being limited just to this road. Uh, so, so you're essentially doubling your capacity per glider um, and w without going through the, the whole rigmarole of transloading. Very, very interesting. Now. You mentioned weight there. How much is there a limit on the amount of obviously there's got to be some limit, but what's the limit on the amount of weight this can pull? Yeah, no, totally. We're, we're, we're playing around with a couple of things. We want to get to 260 tons. That, that's wow. that's our, our whole aspiration because we want, you know, I'm a military guy. So essentially we want to do um, railhead uh, for, for the military. And that, that means uh, mo moving, uh, you know, military cargo, which is very, very, very heavy is one of our um, our customers. Um, but right now we're, we're kind of limited to the 160 tons, which which is which is much more than most folks. Are you getting like when you go onto the rail, do you get significantly more range than when you're driving on the road? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we do because of uh, the the um, the friction. Right. So so, you know, trains, they, they operate um, metal to metal go, goes a lot faster than road to rubber. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So how does this see? Like, what kind of technology is it running on? How is it safe? Like, that's what everyone wants to know. How, like, how, why is it safe to put this on the road? Yeah, totally. So, so we, we have a, a multitude of, of both cameras and, and sensors that, that are 360 degree around uh, the glider. So, so we're able to have uh, predictive technology. We're, we're backed by AI, plus we have uh, humans behind the seat um, that actually monitor um, the, the gliders uh, being operated as a redundant process. Um, so that we have 100% protection. Interesting. Now, so what's the, you mentioned um, defense. So is, is this a department of, the, of defense play? Like what's the commercialization strategy? These projects are very expensive. How do you make money here? Yeah, no, totally. No, th this is actually a commercial strategy. I mean, I would love to do, um, you know, a, a, a defense without the weaponry, <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, just move, moving cargo from from here to there. And that's it. Not not weaponizing it. Um, but it, this the play is to um, start with drayage um, and um, and and do but behind the fence is what we call it drayage and then move to the first mile um, and, instead of having uh, drivers being detained. Um, at the gate waiting for their loads to be picked up. We'll, we'll be the person that picks up that load directly from the boat and then transport it over to its its first uh, chain of custody. Are you manufacturing these already? Or are these just prototypes and, and renders? Where are we at the stage in manufacturing? Gotcha. So, so we're in the process of building our, our first prototype. We have a contract manufacturer, BART Manufacturing, uh, based out of California. Um, we're hoping to do our first beta test in, in June uh, this year. And when fleets go, like, let's say fleets like this, they say, hey, this is a great solution for us. What is sort of the timeline? What's your sort of roadmap to bringing this to market and people can actually put orders in? 
No, totally. Yeah. So, so after we do our beta test um, uh, this this summer, uh, we're we're hoping to uh, do our our next you know public launch um, around uh, Q three of twenty twenty five. What, what's the hardest part of getting this off the ground? Is it that early regulatory stuff? Uh, what's the bottleneck? Is it the tech? Is it is it the regulatory? Is it a little bit of both? Uh, so it's a little bit of both. A little bit of both, and then you know, right, right now the tides and fundraising is 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 uh, is up against us all as as, as startups. So uh, you have the fundraising, then you have the regulatory piece, uh, which we're making a lot of inroads. Where uh, you know, almost daily speaking with uh, the Department of uh, Energy and Department of Transportation in order to bring this into fruition, um, as well as uh, different um, uh, commercialized uh, providers as well. Um, but yeah, th those are those are right now our our, our two hurdles. Um, a lot of our partners in this space are facing the same things. Um, but you know, you know, as a, a former uh, SpaceXer, we know that we have to grit our teeth and continue on pushing forward in order to bring about you know real change for the world. Um, you know, we we feel that our technology is 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 for today, uh, better for tomorrow, and we feel that we're going to be the future of transportation. You know, just imagine a world where. Uh, you're looking out and you're, you're like, hey, man, do I do I do a truck or a train? You say, no, I can do both all at one time. Think about the efficiency of, of uh, eliminating, uh, you know, some, some of these uh, these modes of transport in order to streamline, you know, what that process is uh, to, to make the world, you know, a more efficient place to actually transport. Like how close could these like run t together on a train track? Like if I had a fleet of these, could you like platoon them like, or do they have to have a certain amount of distance between them? No, you can actually platoon them, you know, back to back. You know, one, one thing we're, we're, we're looking at right now, if you see the glider in the front, it has all that space up front. We're actually looking at a, a way to connect an additional kingpin uh, to it. And you can actually link these guys together um, like you would a, a, a train. Say you have um, um, multiple containers that need to go to a destination instead of uh, platooning them next, you know, close together. You can actually attach them like you would a, a train and just have them um, on a uh, on a turntable. Um, j just for the pivot action. In addition, um, we have uh, technology that allows them to to platoon um, and and split off. Um, say they're going to different destinations. So so you have two forms of uh, is essentially uh, containerizing um, it, um, our our glider for deployment. Really, really interesting. Do you have an idea of how much these may like cost? Yes, yes. So um, our our business model is is all subscription. So we're hardware as a service. Uh, so so you essentially. Uh, Least them to a twenty-five thousand. I mean, with that uh, fifty cents per ton mile. Say you're 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 a fleet operator and uh, you have uh, a ton of capacity, but you can't meet because you can't have drivers drive for you because they're not showing up to work. We, we'll go into your operation um, and um, you, you pay us twenty-five thousand dollars a month. Um, that comes with all the the, the maintenance and the service, um, as well as our services to actually uh, transport for you. Uh, we we will transport for you know what the current uh, ton mile rate is. Take fifty cents of that, and then put the rest of that money back into your pocket. So I think the current um, you know cost per ton mile is like a dollar twenty six. We take fifty cents of that, and we give you back all of uh, the, the the residual money. So essentially, you as a provider, you're making money off of utilizing our services while still you know um, uh, contributing to uh, the, the green uh, um, the green pledge. And at the same time, meeting all of your capacity constraints. What now? Here's just my last question: Is what's your like roadside assistance plan? Have you gotten that far? What happens if one of these breaks a tire, battery runs out, something like that? Yeah, no, totally. So, so we have thought about that. Sustainment is a big piece of of logistics, as you know. Um, so, so we're we're thinking about setting up um, uh, proximity crews. You know, say we have a a plant. Um, Port of Woodland is, is one of our first customers. So we will set up um, a plant nearby. We'll, we'll have a service center where we'll have rapid deployed uh, folks that can go out and, and service these gliders. And if we can't, um, you know, service it and, and get it uh, get get your load moving, we'll actually you know put a glider um, uh, in place in order to to transport your goods. We're looking at maybe a, a three hour turnaround for that service. Very, oh, hey, how do people learn more? Where do they go to find out more about this and uh, join you on your journey? Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so so GlideRail.com, um, that's that's where you can uh, uh, reach us uh, or you can you know reach out to us on, on LinkedIn as well. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for stopping by today. We appreciate your time and best of luck with the project. Take care. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. Take care. Take care. All right. Meanwhile, now if you ever wondered what it's like to go up a runaway truck ramp, here is your first-hand point of view experience. 
It looks fun. It does look fun. Like they should have like a roller coaster that's designed like a semi truck, and it's like, and you know, you have seats in the trailer, and you bring it up the hill, and it falls backwards like they have at amusement parks. But the, the annoying thing is, I hear that this like ruins the undercarriage of your truck or your car if you are so unlucky as to have to take one of those. Well, our luck is just improved because Alan Adler, host of Freightwaves Truck Tech, is here. Hey, Alan. Hello, Duder. You've seen some interesting autonomous vehicles in your time, and we're going to talk about one in just a minute here. But what did you think about the uh, the road to rail solution that they were talking about? You know, about? it's interesting, but part of me is like, it's a, answering a question no one asked. I mean, that's the issue with some tech, right? I mean, sometimes it's it, it, it looks complicated. It does look like it could be fraught with, you know, you brought up the maintenance thing. I think that's important. I don't want to, I don't want to rip on these guys for an idea. But at the same time, we've seen this before. Um, there was a, a product uh, that Volvo worked on for a couple of years called Vera, which was kind of the cabless hauler. You know, the idea was autonomy and they were doing it around ports and things like that. But the idea of combining the rail and the road, um, that seems like a bit of a bridge too far to me, especially as you start to see autonomous uh, distribution yards. You know, we had one of those uh, few weeks ago on the show uh, over in Detroit, where you've got the yard dogs that are autonomous and, you know, they're picking up the trailers at the gate and they're parking them and things like that. So maybe this has a place kind of fits in there somewhere, but I don't know. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Very cool. Well, so you took, speaking of autonomous, you went down to Aurora and you got to take a ride in, in an Aurora autonomous truck. We both did that, but you know, I saw a little bit of your video and it looked like there weren't safety drivers in there, were there? No, there weren't. Uh, the only uh, the only person uh, that was in the uh, the truck with me actually there was another uh, another journalist, but also uh, the the person who actually uh, who actually develops the Aurora driver uh, was with us uh, in the truck. But the truck itself, uh, nobody in the driver's seat at all. And yeah, there you go. Uh, and that really sort of took this to the next level for me, Dooner, because I've been in a lot of trucks where we've got safety drivers with their hands hovering over the wheel and that kind yeah. of thing. You know, uh, you wonder if this it's like is a Ouija board, right? When you see the safety drivers, you're like, okay, but his hands are on the wheel. Like I have no idea if he's turning this himself or how much right. effort the driver's putting in this, yeah. no hands. Yeah, no, they're, they're, they're not doing much effort, but this is a, of course extreme because we're, you know, in a, in a test a test facility outside Pittsburgh here. And basically what's going on is course is set up so that there's lots of turns. And ultimately later on, they did a lot of demos of things like, you know, blowing a tire and, you know, having uh, some idiot pass you and cut in front of you and things like that, which of course never happens on the real road. Right. But, uh, but the idea here is that uh, there it goes, see, there goes one cut yeah, right in front of me. Look at that. You know, and, and the truck, you know, so I said, uh, now, you know, f full disclosure, these were done at about 35 miles an hour, but they can use the Aurora driver at, you know, 65 miles an hour. And they are on the, uh, uh, down in Texas uh, right now where they're hauling loads, you know, with safety drivers. But, uh, but this is pretty much the truck that's going to, uh, that, that's going to be the autonomous entry when they get started late this year. What, what is the truck? What, what body is, is their tech put on? This is a this is a Peterbilt 579. Um, they're they have two partners. Uh, Duner, uh, they've got Packard, which of course is Peterbilt and Kenworth in this country, and also Volvo. Uh, they during this event, which was also an analyst event in Pittsburgh, they had um, they had uh, Neil Jager, who is the head of Volvo Autonomous. Uh, uh, there and he, you know, told them about the truck. We actually saw it in Sweden, which is the uh, the, the first of the Volvo autonomous trucks. These two platforms, you know, doing a uh, basically a redundant chassis, meaning you know you have two sets of brakes, you got two sets of steering, you've got two sort of computers, you know, for power and things like that. So you know, a lot going on there. Um, but they are both very close now to having uh, commercially ready um, chassis. How was the ride? Were you, you know, were you holding on for, were you white knuckles? Were you holding on for dear life? Was it smooth? You know what? One of the things they often talk about is the bar factor in autonomous vehicles. So, you know, like if you ever rode, I don't know if you have, like in a in a Waymo vehicle or something like that, you know, the, the robo taxis. But, you know, one of the things that we used to be concerned about in the early days of autonomy back at GM was, uh, you know, people would get, you know, kind of car sick in these things. Nothing like that here. Now, granted, we're not going 65 miles an hour, but we are making turns and things like that. I was not the least bit um, uh, upset by this at all. I, I just was sort of marveling that we had now come to this step because, you know, the opportunity to be in one of these, pretty special, really. What was the um, what was their plan for like that maintenance plan when a tire blows or something like that? 
Well, the, the truck basically uh, knows what to do. It gets to the side of the road and it waits for help or calls for help. I mean, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's not monitoring these trucks. This is not, um, this is not teleops at all, but rather, you know, a signal would go back and, and then, you know, help would be dispatched. But basically the truck behaves itself. It did blow a, a tire. Uh, you know, they had a hard time. It's really funny because the truck sees so much. It's got 25 sensors between cameras, right? Uh, LIDARs and radars on it. It sees everything. So they couldn't fool it into going over the, the spike strip, right? So they had to paint the spike strip the same color as the road so that the truck would run over it. it it's kind of funny, um, you know, to finally get it to blow a tire because this is gonna, it's gonna avoid trouble rather than go into trouble. Hey, what do you think about, speaking of autonomy, what do you think about James Reed joining Walmart? I hear there's, well, I hear there's, I there's stuff happening James when this Reed. first happened. When this first happened, I was like, the, Walmart has big plans. And supposedly in a few months or during this year, they're going to release some of those autonomous plans. Yeah. James Reed is a fascinating guy. He is still very involved at Kodiak. You know, when he left uh, U.S. Uh, was a USA truck, um, you know, and, and, and joined up at Kodiak, you know, we talked to him at that time. And I and I think, you know, getting back into something, you know, like this clearly is going to be- benefit Kodiak as well, because he knows those products very well. But the thing about James Reed is he's got a tech background, Dooner. He is not just a truck guy. Um, comes out of uh, comes out of sort of the Silicon Valley anyway, and then spent a lot of time in the trucking business. But uh, I think you know Kodiak went out of its way to say, look, we didn't lose anything. He just gained another another thing to do. I think you know as the chief operating officer, I think he was for a time at uh, Kodiak. Um, you know, basically brought them to the point where again, like Aurora, they plan to be in commercial operation this year, uh, you know, in Texas, uh, you know, I think he's done as much as he can. He is on this new advisory board. Uh, everybody's got an advisory board, right? Um, yeah. at Kodiak. Mm-hmm. So he's part of that. Uh, you know, so, so is, uh, 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 Brett Suma, you know, uh, who's going to be an early customer at Loadsmith and things like that. So, you know, it appears that all of this makes some sense. I mean, Walmart clearly, you know, benefits from getting into some level of autonomy, you know, hub to hub autonomy, um, you know, from a you know driver perspective, you you use them for the last mile. You don't use them now on the on the hub. You know, going 250, 300 miles. Interesting. Now, where do you rank Aurora with the Kodiaks of the world? Is Aurora uh, the top player here? Who's number one in your mind? Yeah. I think at this point, Aurora's got to be number one. And, and it's always dangerous when you do this. But and here's the reason why they're number one. It's because they're looking far enough ahead and they've got to deal with Co- uh, Continental, which is sort of the number one or top three supplier in the world, to basically do uh, line side or you know integrated manufacturing of the Aurora driver beginning around 2027 in, in Texas. They'll be putting these on truck chassis in the plant. So you won't be, you know, up, uh, you know, retrofitting or anything like that. Now, the first 20 they put out this year, you know, will be retrofit, but they're, they're working very closely with Continental. They've got an agreement uh, that, you know, basically will be a software, a kind of a hardware as a service agreement, really, with Continental to put these in. So I think they've got a longer range plan. Uh, as a public company, we know they have uh, some money. They need more. They, they say they're going to need more to get to actual commercial, real commercial launch in a few years, not just getting started this year. Um, Kodiak, because it's private, we don't really know how much money they have. Um, we do think they've got some great partners and, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Don Burnett and the team out there. So, uh, you know, is it one and one A or one and two? I, I, I couldn't tell you for sure. And you cannot leave Torque Robotics out of this because here is a, a company that, you know, obviously has the Daimler checkbook to work with, uh, you know, in terms of getting itself ready, although they've picked a later date to get into commercial, which would be 2027 for them. Is this, so we're, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but we're also on Sirius XM's Road Dog Truck, and there's probably a lot of drivers fuming right now because we're not being critical enough of autonomous trucks. Are these going to take all the truck drivers' jobs? No, no, Dooner, they're not. And guys, if you're listening, guys and women, if you're listening out there, your jobs are safe arguably, and we'll have to wait and see how it plays out, but it certainly looks like you're going to be able to have more home time if you do end up in some of these other jobs. I don't see jobs going away. The hardest jobs to fill are the long haul trucking jobs, right? I mean, you know, the over the road jobs. There isn't that much demand for them. Young people coming up don't want them. And so autonomy seems to make a lot of sense. It's not going to take over the industry. It's going to be very slow rollout. Uh, it's going to be certain routes. It's going to be things that are repeatable. There's no sense in trying to make an autonomous truck do everything. It's the reason why autonomous trucking makes more sense, arguably, than robotaxis do, because 
yes, they have to learn billions and billions of things, but way fewer than a, a car does, right? I mean, you know, if you're not going to operate these on surface streets, other than sort of getting, you know, off the highway into the, you, you know, to your to your launch site or your landing site, uh, that's about as far as you're going to go. You might drive into a distribution center, but but you're not going to be on surface streets and, and things like that. So. You know, it feels like uh, there, there's no, nothing to really fear. I think if you want a trucking job, they are out there. Now, Aurora, not the only cool place you visited recently. You also went down to sure. GM's Fuel Cell Lab. What goes down at a fuel cell lab, Alan? Well, that was, Duna, that's old home week for me because I worked in fuel cells and media relations at GM, you know, yeah. seven years ago. It was, when I, it was the last, uh, last role I had, one of the last roles I had there. So Charlie Fries, who's our guest today on the show, um, is the head of Hydrotech, which is the the name of their product. They're, they actually have a, a, a production product now, a fuel cell system, that they have cut some deals like with Autocar, which is not a name we hear a lot about, but they do kind of severe service trucking and you know uh, trash trucks, things like that. And then also with Kamatsu, the big off-highway construction uh, company, uh, they've got a deal as part of Super Truck 3 with the DOE for medium duty utility trucks. So after years and years, I mean like over 50 years of fuel cell work at GM, you're finally starting to see this roll out into commercial spaces where it makes sense. So we get Charlie uh, Freeze, who I, I know well, there's Charlie. Yeah. We get Charlie to take us through the lab today. He shows us a lot of what happens there as well as a pretty good discussion on, on things, you know, where does fuel cell fit? I mean, this is an old diesel guy. Charlie started at uh, at Detroit Diesel before it was taken over. Alan, what, is that, what does that machine do? What does that machine that we're looking at do? Uh, you know what? I'm not even sure where you're standing next to. I took a quick step. It, it's, it's, one, it's a test cell of some sort. Um, we see a lot more of these during the uh, uh, d during the episode, you know, we take a walk along some of the cells that uh, are measuring different sizes of fuel cell stacks and things like that, looking for, you know, what are the best ways to get out impurities and things like that. He goes into a cold chamber. He says, well, I said, what's that for? He said, well, you know, water freezes. And if water freezes and expands, it can crack things. And you don't want that. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff like that in there. 24 minutes. Very, very happy with this episode. Uh, GM, thanks for, for letting us in. It was great to get in there. What, what, um, you know, when we talk about batteries, a, a big issue with them, especially in electrification, is just the weight and everything like that. What about the fuel cell tech? Like, I, I talked to a guy, I had a guy uh, review a Nikola. He had a, the Nikola fuel cell. He liked it a lot. Um, granted, he really wanted to guy. sort of prove it's a good concept. But what do you think about all this? Well, they are lighter for one thing. They're lighter and they, they do not take the weight of batteries. I mean, the more, the, the farther you want to go uh, in a truck with a battery, you need more batteries on board. Therefore, you're sacrificing cargo capacity, right? And unless you get a rule change, which is unlikely, you do have some states and I think federally there's, there's some provisions for battery electric trucks being able to go to 82,000 pounds instead of 80,000. But, you know, to really carry a lot of batteries to go a long, long way, uh, you know, Tesla is the only one that's got anywhere near the charging capacity right now with the semi to be able to approximate, you know, kind of a, a, a long haul run where you might recharge one time. But uh, but basically the fuel cell is for long range, you know, high power need vehicles. Um, I think the, the fellow you talked to, I know I've talked to him as well. Uh, he goes about 400 miles from Oakland down to, I believe, somewhere in the England Empire in Southern California, uh, Ontario to fuel and things like that. And I don't know, I haven't talked to him in a while and I didn't catch your show. I want to do that. But, um, uh, you know, but I think I think he's got an opportunity there you know, right now because he paid practically nothing for the truck. I mean, you know, really, uh, you know, compared to what you might have to pay when the incentive environment settles out someday. But, uh, you know, expensive truck, but it works. And that's the thing. And I think you're going to find certain applications, you know, drayage, uh, regional hall, things like that, that that fuel cells will work for. Um, one of the things we talked to Charlie about, though, is something I've been sort of poking around at, and we're going to Cincinnati uh, tomorrow to- Wait, Alan, you know, I'm going to have to send them to the it. show. Alan, I'm going to have to send them to okay. Truck Tech to check that out because we are running out of time. So good teaser, but where do people go to find Truck Tech? Well, right now you go to the Freight Waves YouTube channel and you go to shows and then you go to Truck Tech and there's a playlist there. Very cool. I'm not really sure what happened <laughs> on my screen here, but bear with us. Hey, we got Jesse. Thank you so much, by the way. Elsewhere. Elsewhere. <laughs> there you go. What are we looking at here, by the way? Oh, this is what we're looking at. This is a... Take, take, look at the left of the screen. There's a truck, a big semi-truck that has fallen off the side of the road. 
It's going to be a very, very expensive tow. Might even raise their insurance rates. What do you think, Jesse? Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, that, sometimes that happens. Can't say for sure, but that's a risk. That looks pretty bad. That looks expensive because of the way he fell down there. Like yeah. you've got, and if you look too, there's like three wreckers over there. That's going to cost him big money. We that, had a that tow. That happens a lot. Wreckers don't usually come in singles. No, it's expensive too, right? Like yes, truck it's tows? very expensive. You know what? That's something that we should add to our list of um, topics today yeah. is um, to look at the towing coverage on your policy. So I'll, I'll put that on our well, list. Well, let's too. do it. We're looking at cutting costs and, and insurance, and especially as you scale and grow. What kind of tips do you have for us today? Yeah. So um, thanks for having me on, Dinner. Oh, Great absolutely. to see you. Thanks for coming to the studio. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that one of the most important things to consider when you are trying to grow either as a trucking company or a freight broker is that it's critical that your claims get paid. And there's no real right or wrong way to buy insurance as long as you know what you're buying and you know what's covered. So yeah. I want to touch on cargo a little bit. I will say about towing, just since we um, talked about that most recently, that there can be a towing supplement in your policy. So it would typically fall under the physical damage for a motor carrier. And you could have a towing limit that's only ten dollars or $15,000. Well, if you've ever had a tractor towed, you know that there's a good chance that that's not enough. So it, if it's going to be a long distance, right, if you can tow it to somewhere that's pretty close by, that might be okay. So that's just an example of something to look at. You can just ask your agent if, you know, what your towing limits are. Now, um, talking about cargo, which, yeah. you know, this is really something that's sensitive in our industry right now. It's no secret that there's a lot of cargo theft. Yeah. People are really going through it. So understanding your cargo coverage that you currently have and also what to buy, I think is really important. So I'm just going to kind of go through what, some of the different cargo options are specifically for freight brokers because I think truckers get a lot more education around insurance earlier in their career and process. I think it's more critical to them from the beginning, mm. but we are starting to see a greater need for uh, brokers to be a lot more educated and buy beefier insurance policies, if you will. So, most what are people, some of yeah. yeah, great. So most people are familiar with contingent cargo, and I think that that's what most brokers start out with. Contingent cargo is only going to pay; it's contingent upon the failure of the motor carrier's coverage. Yeah. So the the trick there is that you it might take a little while to get a denial from the insurance company. So if you can make your shipper wait that long to be made whole then maybe that's the right path for you. If you don't want to make your shipper wait that long to be made whole, then you're probably going to have a challenge with contingent cargo. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, next would be cargo legal liability. So cargo legal liability is going to pay if you are legally liable for, um, for the cargo, whether that's by contract, verbal agreement, typically speaking, okay, this is not all insurance policies, but uh, by contract, um, a verbal agreement, something like that. If you're liable, it will pay. Um, and then shipper's interest, you know, kind of um, basically shipper's interest is if the shipper has an interest in the claim being paid, you know, outside of some exceptions, then it's going to be paid. So those are kind of the basics in terms of cargo insurance. And again, it's just really important to understand which it is that you bought, what some of the exclusions are, which I'm happy to go through some common exclusions. Well, you mentioned something really interesting too, and it's it's that, you know, I mean, cargo insurance is up, but theft is up as well. Um, and I had a, I was listening to a video from a carrier yesterday and he was actually warning his customers. And he says, look, when the rates are this bad, I'm hearing from these other guys, they're cutting their insurance. They're, they're not covering themselves and right. they're putting shippers at risk. Is this yes. a real concern right now? Well, it is. And, you know, the federal filings are public for auto liability insurance, but they are not public for cargo. And so... Why is that? Um, Would it give out too much info, I guess, on cargo? Or? I, I don't know. I don't know why it's not public, but it's not. So it's not something that you can check with FMCSA the way that you can liability. So that's why I think a lot of brokers are starting to buy their own primary cargo insurance so that they don't have to rely upon the motor carrier's insurances heavily. Wow, wow. So, yeah. 
So what else is going on? There's, there, 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 there's so much going on there. There's so much regulatory risk. There's so much insurance risk. There's so much accidents. There's <laughs> yeah. so much theft risk. What advice do you have from how, how do you stay whole? How do you protect your shipper yeah. and yourself? Because these, like, these thefts, too, that you mentioned, like it's not just the cost of the cargo. You're going to lose that customer. The shipper themselves is going to lose that inventory, especially some of these smaller companies that have been hit. Right. One guy had yogurt stolen. Like, who steals yogurt? What are you even going to do with it? Well, people steal yogurt because then the evidence is gone. Yeah. So food and beverage is a big target right now because the evidence is consumed. There are no tracking numbers, things like that. So that's a lot of yogurt. Know, it, in that's that's a lot of yogurt. Water. That's a lot of yogurt, you know. Um, so things that you can look for on your policy um, to make sure that you're covered. There can be theft exclusions, a broad theft exclusion on your policy. Um, a great trick is to just hit control F and look for the things that you hope are covered. So control F, theft. Um, so reefer breakdown, it's yeah. really important to make sure that reefer breakdown is covered. Um, sometimes driver error is excluded under reefer breakdown. So you know, if you're brokering reefer or you're hauling reefer, you want to make sure that that's covered. These losses and these thefts in the industry are going to cause insurers to want to restrict coverage. They don't, you know, it, insurance companies are in business to um, be profitable. Sure. And, um, you know, so this theft trend is having a very negative impact on the insurance industry as well, unfortunately. Is there anything the insurance industry is doing about it? Like yes. know, putting out sting trailers? It seems like the yes. law is not doing enough. For A lot of people are very frustrated. Well, I think that the volume of claims and the volume of theft is overwhelming law yeah. enforcement. And so one thing that you can do to be helpful to law enforcement is, you know, be, you've got to file a police report, be ready, have your information ready when you're filing a police report. If they find your cargo, go and get it. If they find your cargo, you have to go get it because they cannot store it for you. Um, there are a lot of insurance companies who are doing a lot. Um, Travelers has a SIG unit where, where they will go. Um, they do st set up sting trailers. They are absolutely trying to catch the bad actors. But, you know, everybody's got to do their part. It's tough. I mean, they have a lot of information, it seems. And, like, the they new do. the new vector that I'm hearing in Southern California that they're attacking isn't the main carrier. It's the transfer carrier. So it goes into the port, goes to the transfer carrier, and they're finding big weaknesses there. Yeah. And I think shippers and brokers might be a little blind to it because they're like, well, it's just the transfer carrier. That's not the main one. Right. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And because of the intensity of this problem and because of the volume of these thefts, there no link in the supply chain is safe from our scrutiny right now. What about what about the fleets out there that are like, man, our premiums are getting too high. We're, we're thinking about closing up. What can they do to sort of mitigate some of those costs? Yeah. So taking on a little bit of a deductible or taking on a retention, depending on your size, depending on your appetite for that is a great idea. Yeah. Um, you know, looking at all of your policies and seeing if you feel like you're getting a fair shake in the marketplace, you know, it's always good to um, make sure your insurance agent is going out to market for you on your behalf and getting the most competitive rates. Um, but yeah, I, that's one of the easy ways to do it. And also on the liability side, making sure that your house is in order in terms of safety, in terms of your inspections, things like that. Your safety scores have um, a big bearing on your insurance premium, as does your claim history. So, you know. There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to talk about. I definitely want to send some people your way on the, and then I got to ask you a quick question about the young professionals. Oh, great. Yeah. Of course please. you're here. But sure. where do people go to learn more about Reliance and maybe connect with you to talk about some of these issues? Sure. I know everyone's having them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Reliancepartners.com is where you can find our agency. And um, you can email me, jesse.merritt at reliancepartners.com. I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, cool. And we have a, yeah. about an extra 40 seconds here. So great. Tell, tell us what's new. Well, the latest with the professionals. We've been covering yeah. that story on the, store, on the show. Yeah, great. So there is a baseball night coming up for the East Tennessee Young Professionals. I think it's April 9th. I'll wow. send you a link on it. Sure. Um, we've got a lot of stuff coming up. I'll send you a full calendar. But, you know, Tennessee Trucking News put us on the – cover for the toy drive, which we were really grateful for yes, last time I was congratulations, here. Congratulations, by the way. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you so much for the publicity that you have helped oh. uh, give that cause. We're really grateful. Hey, any good stuff like that. You got a good story like that. Of course, more than happy to cover it. Well, Jesse, thank, thank you, you so much for coming Thanks, down Dinner. to the show yeah, today. Great to see you. It's been a, a, fortunately yesterday we avoided those tornadoes. I don't like my kids got right. to school yesterday. Yeah, ours, we were lucky. We're in Davidson County. And so it was just after, after yes. school care that was. But for all of you that are impacted, we feel for you. Hopefully Absolutely. everything gets back yeah. in order. And I know there's okay. more storms out there. So drivers, drive safe today and tonight. Find me on Twitter at Timothy Dooner. Find the show at FW What the Truck. We're on our YouTube channel or at 5 p.m. Series XM's Road Dog Truck. Oh, oh, right. You're on the radio right now. Great. I yeah. love to be on the radio. Well, you can hear yourself. You. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, take care, everybody. Don't be a stranger. See you next time.